So today, as we said, we're going to have Lawrence go through uh, what he did for the EBTC engagement uh, when it comes to evaluating where the code was at in terms of adding new functionality to uh, raise the coverage and also covering a new functionality, which is, is which we call the yield story. So without further ado, here's Lawrence. Thanks, Alex. Um, I think everyone should be able to hear me. Uh, the mic check just now. So yeah, I'm Lawrence. I'm uh, working for Recon as a junior fuzz fuzzing engineer. And yeah, like Alex explained, I came on board to help with EBTC at the end, uh, just to add a few things to him and Antonio's hard work. So yeah, uh, I'm going to share my screen. And yeah, if there's any questions or anything, please feel free to uh, to just stop me. So let's share my screen. Please let me know if you guys can see it. Yeah, looks good. Cool. So yeah, uh, let's just make sure it's nice and big. So yeah. Um, Coming into EBTC, um, I was tasked with getting the fork testing up and going. Um, just needed a few tweaks so that we could expand the coverage there. And uh, yeah, there were a few challenges. But to start off with uh, what I saw when uh, when I came on board is that the, the fuzzing setup was done in a way where going from the non forked to the fork setup uh, was actually quite um, quite polished by the time I got there. Um, and the fork setup itself actually had two phases um, because it was it, the fork setup started pre-deploy before the EBTC contracts were live. And yeah, uh, so they started before the EBTC contracts were live. So then we were forking against uh, contracts that we would be integrating with. And then the second phase of the fork was actually where we forked against the actual live EBTC contracts. So this uh, this presented, of course, would present a few challenges, but what made it quite easy was that, well, relatively easy, was that going from non-fork to fork, um, EBTC used create three deterministic deployments. So all the contract addresses were known beforehand. And this made it much simpler going from uh, basically uh, not needing to redesign the whole setup. We could simply cast the addresses that we knew were going to be the addresses uh, into all the different components of the EBT system, which is quite a complex system. Um, so this is just an example of the code for the the latest uh, mainnet uh, fork. So it simply it was easy to just plug and play. Whereas for the non uh, pre deployment, these contracts weren't deployed on the forked state yet, and we basically deployed them knowing that they will end up at these addresses in any case. So um, another gotcha that uh, I ran into when going from the forked, uh, non-forked to forked, was that we need to always be careful about the mocks that we implement, um, because it's easy to quickly implement a mock thinking we know exactly what it does, but comparing it to mainnet when we actually cast it to, um, to the actual, let's say, collateral token address, so the CS collateral token tester, that was the, the mock that we used. And this is the actual uh, staked ETH address. Now, there was a small change uh, that caused the uh, deposits to the, the staked ETH address to actually fail. And once it fails, it it's a pain to debug <laughs> because it reverts silently. So it's always a good idea when going from non-forked to make sure the mocks are carefully evaluated, making sure that they're not being reverted silently, silently and being missed. 
um, enabling that also helps, of course, a lot with, <laughs> with coverage. Uh, it's actually quite an interesting journey and the, the code is all public as far as I remember. So it's a interesting journey to go from the release 0 0.7 to the first fork, uh, fork fuzzing. Uh, you can see how Antonio uh, improved the, the fork test there. And then once we uh, had the deployment, we had some fun because in pre-deploy fork state, we always spend the time and the block stamp to get started with because we want a stable chain to set up our forks and test uh, as thoroughly as we can test, uh, as thoroughly as we can fuzz. But in a post-deploy fork state, we no longer worried about pinning the date and the, with the timestamp and the, and the block. Excuse me. Uh, because now the focus shifts from getting as much coverage as we can um, in a single fork run to getting as much coverage as we can with the latest chain state. Because the chain is, is never stable in the sense that there are always parts of the system that are changing. And using the latest part makes it much easier to uh, to find the issues that maybe if a governance proposal changes the uh, the profit yield chain, do we know what's going to happen in the current chain state? So using the latest forks that we can, it makes it much easier. So this is, of course, important for something that we do at Recon, which is uh, regular or automated fork fuzzing against the current chain state. Uh, so we offer a few, <laughs> a few of these awesome products, but basically we have regular jobs running every hour, um, fuzzing the fuzzing a short run against the state as it is at this moment. Um, so this just required some tweaking with, with the RPC forks, but uh, nothing, <laughs> nothing too major. For the post fork deploy state, of course, there is always going to be some difficulties because when we need to use uh, the price feed, uh, we can't just simply use our mock and say, uh, set the, the state ETH price to this to simulate a rebase. So what we ended up doing was we went to, let me go get this. Let's just show this part. So for uh, the tester itself, we decided to actually manipulate the storage of the price feeds. So to set it into its fallback position uh, fallback state so that we could manipulate the um, the price feed itself with the, with the, the values that we had so let me show you guys here which was quite cool you know for tester so yeah uh, what you can see here we we are going to it's called the price feed mock because we ported it from uh, from our initial setup, but it is actually the uh, the EBTC price feed. And we're just going right into the second storage slot um, and setting it to zero so, so that it sees the, uh, the main oracle is down. It needs to use the latest price. And then we simply load that price. We uh, use it to clamp the new price. And then we store this price back into, into the price feed. And what this effectively does is we are simulating a rebase from state ETH, which the system, which is heavily integrated into the system. This is where the yield comes from. So uh, this is the same for, for this year. So it was a fun experience to actually go in, look at the slots, see where we need to manipulate them directly to get the desired outcome. And yeah, uh, it's 
it sounds simpler when I talk about it, <laughs> but going through it, it was, it was quite a fun learning experience. Yeah, is maybe there we have some any uh, questions about this. Yeah, I think we'll have a question. I saw somebody typing, but uh, I have a question for you, uh, just as uh, people, uh, you know, think about it. But would you mind showing us the uh, original version of how set price was written, so the pre fork version, and then give us a bit more context around uh, why you uh, had to effectively. Uh, store the value. Can you give us a bit more uh, context there? Yeah, sure. Um, so going back to, let's just take the, okay, I can actually just show the, the tester. Ah, okay, so that test is not working like that. So this would be in the target functions because we are overriding target functions in in the fork tester. So looking at how these are here. So what we could do is in the previous one, we basically had the ability to um, set the F per share directly. Because of because it was a mock um, before it was uh, before we do, were doing fork testing, and this is the the peril of mocks. It makes it very easy to uh, to set and get good coverage and test the system, treating it as a black box. But uh, once we move on chain, we have to be sure that we are we can't use mocks. So we have to either directly manipulate the um, the prices. And there were a few options for this too. Uh, of course, we could directly manipulate, we could try to directly manipulate state ETH, but that is a whole different, uh, a whole different level of complexity. Sorry for my dogs, just barking a bit. Um, yeah, so the easiest way is that we were actually um, getting the, the if per share from the, the price feed. Um, and that was the, so we decided to manipulate it via that. We just go back to the fork tester. Okay, so uh, I might not have been clear, but the, the set price is for the, uh, for the ETH EBTC price. And uh, or the state ETH EBTC price. That's a composite price feed, uh, custom for EBTC protocol. And then the set ETH per share, um, that is specific to the collateral token. So we, in our previous, uh, you know, in the previous non-forked setup, we could use our mocks to change these values simply. Um, we can't do that with the fork setup. So go in, um, manipulate the variables, uh, the storage slots. It's the simplest way. Does that make it clearer? Yeah. And so this is um, something where my side note, uh, as I ask you about, uh, I guess, how you figure out that we, that was necessary. This is something that we already talked about in another video related to EBTC, which was tied to the Oracle bug that we missed. Uh, I just want to say how important it is that as a project, you end up running the tests, as in you actually run it as long as it takes to get to full coverage. Because uh, as far as I can tell, had we not do this extra engagement, uh, these aspects of the code were simply not written. And so while we had uh, a extremely thorough local tester. I believe we ran it over 200 million tests uh, on the local version. Uh, as far as I remember, Lawrence, the fork version um, didn't add any implementation of these seller functions. So it was effectively giving us a false sense of security, more so than an actual sense that the tests were actually being run. 
Oh yes, uh, I remember what you're talking about there is before uh, in the previous fuzzing branch, we, I think there was some difficulties getting it set up. Um, so Antonio did, um, did identify it, but I think as we continued, we figured out that these were still, um, were still missing. So we actually came across these, uh, once I was, uh, just reviewing everything again. And we can see here that we noticed that there, there's an issue, but it was, I think, very challenging to, um, within the time frame to actually get fixed. So yeah, uh, at least he, he did note this, um, and that made it very simple to, to identify and get it set up. But you're perfectly correct. If we, if we didn't review, um, we might have missed this, uh, and because we are basically just skipping it, it's so easy to to think you're you're actually covering everything, and yeah, uh, the the father is not going to hold your hand in that sense. Anyone else have a question? Yeah, if you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat. I definitely I agree with you there. I think uh, um, uh, we we can go to kind of your next topic about uh, um, the, um, the the yield share, uh, unless perhaps you have some thoughts around uh, the future of uh, forked fuzzing. Obviously, we did uh, a, another event where we spoke about doing live properties, and uh, uh, we also had a um, some we're, we're having internal talks about some of the. Um, the ways in which this could be done. I guess if you wanted to give some uh, personal advice to projects uh, uh, trying to go from a, a local tester to a forked tester, would you uh, recommend it? Would you recommend instead double down on the local version? Uh, what, what are your thoughts in terms of, uh, I guess, the trade-offs of uh, having to set this up? And also in terms of just recommendation in order to set this up in a way that uh, helps the project uh, instead of, you know, giving them a false sense of security. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think from my side of what I would say is I would approach it first. Uh, the first step is to get as much coverage locally as you can. Um, from personal experience, it's usually easier. Um, so you move quicker, uh, and there's often low hanging fruit that you need to work through and identify, uh, before you, and in terms of your time spent, uh, trying to implement everything on a forked, on a forked run from the start might make it more difficult because you can't treat everything as a black box. Uh, on a fork run. Um, so I, my advice would usually be we, we start locally, uh, get as much coverage as we can, usually use Medusa to get that uh, coverage uh, going, uh, let it cook, then recheck it, see how where we can improve the coverage. Uh, I think once you're happy with, once you have good, excellent coverage locally, uh, where you've used your mocks, uh, so you can easily change variables that might not be easily changeable on chain. Then you, I would go to a forked, a forked environment, and then you have, uh, then you would usually pin the fork. Um, make sure you have a static uh, timestamp and block from which you are working, um, just so that you limit the moving variables at the start. Um, in EBTC's case, uh, the design's decision was to have uh, counterfactual deployments or deterministic deployments from start, so that made the setup easy for them. But uh, it's not that you have to have that. So you clone the you you fork the chain, you deploy your your contracts, make sure everything talk is integrated well and set up correctly, and then uh, checking the the coverage from there. Again, because the coverage might fall because there might be a difference between the mocks and the real thing. Um, and once coverage, once again, has reached a, a good point and the, the properties are holding, 
then I would, like we say, uh, shift to uh, forking, uh, always forking from the latest block because you, you, the the environment on chain changes, and it's you don't want to test in the past. You you do want to tr test in the present as well because you're going to be deploying in the present. That clear? Yeah, clear for me. Thank you for your thoughts. And without uh, further ado, uh, I think you can uh, talk a little bit about the yield story. Uh, for context, uh, um, we, I mean, we've done many rounds of manual review and uh, we've also, uh, the, the team has done six audits. And uh, I also have done uh, a uh, survey of every uh, um, warden that participated in our contest to understand how much time they spent. And so from talking to them and then talking to the team, it was clear that a lot of attention was uh, spent in preventing uh, rug pulls, preventing obvious bugs, preventing liquidations. Uh, but it wasn't clear whether as much time was spent on the yield side. Uh, one of the findings from Coderina was tied to how the sorting of CDPs could change due to that. And so the yield story, this idea of being able to track uh, where all of the tokens go, uh, was kind of uh, something that we've uh, talked with the Badger team for a long time. And uh, uh, given the fact that all you know more severe, more critical uh, risks were uh, already mitigated, uh, it made sense at the time to start uh, with that. So without further ado, Lawrence, uh, take it away. Cool. Yeah, um, like Alex said, I, I helped a bit with implementing some properties for the yield story. Um, so the yield story is basically just what we call the, the concept of yield in EBTC. Uh, the idea is um, EBTC doesn't charge any um, any fees for borrowing uh, Bitcoin, but you they get funded through what we call a profit yield share. Um, so that means that staked ETH, of course, has regular rebases um, that <laughs> supposedly always uh, go up, but we all know that they, they can be slashed as well. So from rebase to rebase is basically what we're talking about when we say yield. The, the amount of underlying is worth more, so there's growth. Now, EBTC takes, um, takes uh, how should I say, generates some revenue um, from this by taking a percentage of, the, of this uh, profit yield, of this yield. So the yield story is that for every change for every rebase, for every bit of growth uh, between two points, if the yield uh, yield share is not zero, then EBTC should get the appropriate amount of yield and the user should get uh, the basically the yield growth minus the, the fee percentage. So uh, this is yeah, uh, to get started with it, like the two main goals were to make sure that great fields are, the fees are taken from the yield. That's quite obvious. And also to make sure that the fees hold from transaction to transaction or basically from user to user, rebase to rebase. So um, I talked a lot with Alex at the start of this and the advice was that um, we to, to keep two things in mind is that we generally don't want to use the same math calculations that the protocol is using where we know that the formula should hold um, it because it's a very generalized formula. It's a taking of a percentage of the yield. And the second approach that the second thing we wanted to keep in mind is we want to keep um, the checks as uh, I wrote here recursive checks, but it's basically checks that build on on each other so if we if we know what the math is going to be for 
uh, for any amount of yield growth, and the fee is expected for that. We can, instead of trying to keep track of the, um, of like every bit of fee that increases, where we say, oh, the delta is this, so we have X amount of yield, and then the delta, the yield share is this, <laughs> and we have Y, and then yield share goes up. So if you want to get the, um, like the total yield, my, sorry, my, my drawing is bad there, but you get the idea. So if you want to have the total yield share that we expect between this point, you would have to, to calculate this and keep track of everything. But because we knew the math, um, we could simply just keep track of every uh, amount of fees that should be captured at every rebase. Because if we ensure that the invariant is holding between these two points, and then between these two points following that, and then between these two points, we know that the invariant must hold in general as well. So, yeah, uh, taking a look at some of it for the for the math, uh, they they use different math. So we we decided to go much simpler, and we just took the amount of growth that we have, take it as a percentage, and we uh, subtract that from the uh, from the yield growth expected for the for the user, as well as for the uh, for the protocol in later invariants, and that made it much simpler to track. I uh, don't need don't need to keep track of a general invariant in the sense of from point A to infinity. We're keeping track from each defined segment between the rebases. So yeah, uh, it's actually quite simple. Um, the math is very generalized percentage math. Nothing, nothing funny. We also did some um, some work to make sure that the the CDP's values are also keeping in check, so that we could um, make sure that the user isn't losing any um, any yield. Uh, when compared to someone that's uh, not invested in the in the protocol, or any more yield than they need to lose uh, or need to share in this case. Um, so it's very simple simple checks. We are once again checking percentage wise, but we are always making sure that this is only done once there has been a change in the state index because that indicates a re rebase. Um, and for all of these, we also make sure that we are using our before and after ghost variables to keep track of these moment to moment uh, between each rebase. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a simple, some of it is simple. <laughs> it always looks simple at the start, but there's a lot of thought going into the, the simple properties as well. Is there any specific part I would you want me to expand on, Alex? Yeah, first of all, uh, I would like to emphasize how the this uh, idea of inductive uh, uh, proofs comes into play um, with with the the idea that you mentioned, Lawrence. Is that we can prove a global property, and specific we can prove that a global property holds at all time by simply demonstrating that each segment or each time we check the property, the property is holding. And so that's a important thing to keep in mind is that when you set up such a uh, even mission critical uh, type of checks, you don't actually have to track the entirety of the story uh, in storage, for example, you don't have to reconstruct the whole story and look at it at all times, simply because you can use uh, inductive proofs to demonstrate that it's going to be safe. But that said, what I would like for you to expand on a bit is, I guess, the difference between checking the story on a user, as in you were checking the yield, uh, 
gained by the system against uh, the yield of a user versus uh, checking the uh, yield of a no, uh, user that is not deposited on the uh, system. And I would like for you to elaborate a little bit why uh, that gives better assurances that I guess simply checking uh, that the fee math is never, you know, more than 100% or something like that. Sure. Yeah, so our, uh, our first invariant was if I do not, um, if I deposit my collateral in the protocol, do I get the same amount of, uh, of yield on it if I do not have, uh, if there's no PYS? Um, this is very simple and it, it should be um, should be obvious, but it's always a good idea to check that the that the math um, supports what the uh, what the CDP's collateral actually says that there's no loss of a uh, loss of shares or loss of value between rebase to rebase. So the first the first invariant checks for um, a non uh, non deposited user uh, or non collateral. Uh, supplier um, against just someone that's that's an actor that's just uh, holding collateral inside the system, and then we check that the uh, in the following invariance. Once we check that uh, our rebase is equal moment to moment uh, from the <laughs> compared to the previous rebase and the current rebase, are we losing yield or are we, uh, as expected, or are we actually gaining more or less than what we than what we should? Um, so we, we always come back to uh, doing this in percentages, simply checking the yield actors and the non-yield actors um, against the expected fees and then checking that against the actual fees that we get um, from the uh, basically from the CDP collateral shares and the value um, obtained from them. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, let's uh, yeah, let's uh, and uh, I'm just gonna ask you like a difficult question. I, I just want to hear your thoughts. And it's about yeah. the precision so let's talk about a bit about where EVTC has precision loss which is something that you know a lot of time was spent in uh, quantifying but let, let's uh, give us your thoughts about uh, these canary values for precision as in why would you want to allow some level of loss and what do you expect will be the loss given uh, you know precision loss versus what what would be an unacceptable uh, loss in in this context? Yeah, that is <laughs> that is a, a difficult one. But yeah, we we actually did run into into this, um, which I think is why you're asking about it, um, because we we do round up. So there there would be like one way of. Um, of shares per uh, one way of dust per CDP, uh, if I'm co remembering correctly. I think we set this up as well in the yeah in the setup where we needed to. This is not the latest one. There, yeah, there was a part where I just can't uh, think of it now, but where we basically had to. Um, account for precision loss uh, and for dust uh, dust variables or, or dust values that were that were captured in in rounding up um, during some of the normal operations of the uh, of the open CDPs and redeeming and liquidating. Um, yeah, I can't. And just go back to properties. Yeah, so 
I'm sorry, Alex, I can't remember off the top of my head uh, all the all the rounding stuff. But yes, there we do know there was uh, some precision loss. Um, this was like one way um, in that uh, in that case uh, that but it accumulated as the time uh, as time continued, which was which caused quite a few errors as we <laughs> as we had to retest. And especially once we retested uh, going to uh, the forks as well, because then uh, the value isn't as easily tracked uh, because you, you can't traverse the, sh the chain beforehand as well. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is something that uh, I think as uh, professionals, we don't tell uh, projects what to do uh, on this specific uh, decision of the precision loss. But it's, it's something that you have to figure out for yourself and then uh, you have to model because based on a different context, the precision loss could lead to more problems. What uh, uh, we did with Badger uh, after the multiple contests, bug bounties, etc., was we uh, ended up checking how the precision loss was uh, uh, dealt. We found uh, uh, what we could argue are flaws in the um, entire model. So this is not a EBTC only uh, problem, uh, uh, but fundamentally the um, every time the stakes are, uh, or there's a redistribution around stakes, you end up having um, a precision loss that uh, uh, accounts to the total number of stakes uh, effectively divided by 118. And that's simply because there's this uh, magnifying value to uh, reduce it by a bit. But it fundamentally means that you could actually have up to one way per stake where stake roughly uh, maps out to the collateral. And that's on a per CDP uh, or rather per redistribution event. So the precision loss uh, in absolute numbers ends up being fairly small. However, the precision loss in magnified numbers, which is multiplied by 118, actually ends up being pretty big. You end up having like a 1.8 uh, E18 value, which will be basically two uh, ways of dust that would have to be redistributed over tens, if not hundreds of CDPs. Uh, that said, um, uh, that's why we used a canary value of something like one, one million or one billion, uh, simply because it's still uh, uh, you know, logarithmically half of 118, so it's still a fairly small value, but it ends up being a precision that would uh, uh, alert us immediately. Like if there was such a precision loss of that magnitude, given the fact that it would have to be amplified by 118, then if we had one million ways of... Uh, uh, precision loss, we would immediately want to be alerted. And that's why we set it to that value. It's simply because it's absolutely impossible compared to our understanding of, you know, the system we wrote uh, versus a 100, 1000 uh, type uh, units of uh, uh, dust. They could actually happen over uh, effectively 1000 uh, uh, precision loss scenarios. So that was uh, um, the, the thinking, at least on my end, but that's not something we uh, impose to our customers. We typically recommend that you uh, effectively uh, make that decision and typically making that decision consists of writing a repro for this type of bug and then asking uh, security researchers for, for their thoughts. And once you poked enough, you should have the, the ability of reaching your conclusion. So that was kind of the um, work we did at EBTC. Obviously, we, we wish them uh, enormous success. And so I guess as a uh, closing uh, statement, I guess I'll show my screen for just a couple of minutes on this. Uh, uh, we just launched on uh, the Recon app. So as we spoke about uh, EBTC, we uh, uh, effectively merged the features that we demoed last week or like the couple uh, last couple of weeks with the live monitoring the ability of checking these live properties and then the recurring jobs which effectively allow to perform these tests on a recurring schedule 
And thanks to Lauren's work, uh, these recurring jobs will also be uh, using uh, the same corpus, which means that in the next few weeks, we will be able to build a big corpus through a multi-million test run. And then we're gonna be able to reuse it on a much shorter uh, repetitive run as a means to verify if some setting or something that happened uh, has changed uh, the system. And then the last thing, uh, which is something we're, we're working on right now is going to be governance fuzzing, which is the idea of being able to test uh, the a, a smart contract system uh, before a certain operation happens and after a certain operation happens. We'll be sharing our uh, uh, research there and we'll be sharing the implementation for the EBTCKs as they uh, head into their first real governance uh, uh, scenario of changing the uh, protocol yield share. And then over time, we're going to be uh, sharing this research, research with other teams and hopefully set up live monitoring for them as well. Uh, but with that said, uh, this is going to be the conclusion of our office hours. Lawrence, thank you so much for presenting this week. If you can all give a clap for Lawrence, uh, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom. And hopefully over time, this is gonna be more of a recurring event in uh, uh, as, as part of a promise I made on the last Thursday of the week, we typically show POCs. However, all of the previous contests we've done with uh, Recon have yet to be uh, judged and the results have, are yet to be live. So for this month, there's not gonna be any Recon winner, but that said, um, definitely consider using the Recon starter for your uh, contest participations as a means to get a bonus and also get featured in our office hours. With that said, thanks Lawrence again for hosting and you guys have an amazing rest of your week. See you next Thursday.